Well, thank you. It's good to be here with you this morning. As Don mentioned, I have the honor and privilege of presiding over Rosho Christi, which is on 130 campuses and at various locations around the world. Our mission is to equip students and professors with historical, philosophical, and scientific reasons for following Jesus. And among those various issues, this issue of critical race theory or critical theory more broadly is up at the top of the charts right now. Things are happening at the university at breakneck speed, and the old king is quickly being dethroned, naturalism, in favor of this new beast. So if you've heard of neo-atheism, they ain't got nothing on the neo-Marxists, right? Um, as we uh, get into critical race theory and figure out how to engage it, um, you know, in, in 1989, in the West, the world celebrated because we thought that the wall had fallen. And with that, Marxism and communism was gone. It was that exact year that CRT began, and not without accident. Without giving a definition of it right now, uh, sort of unorthodox in a sense. I'll wait till midway through after I've unpacked it, given some historical development, tried to describe it, because it's not entirely easy to define. There's not one single definition of it, even by its own proponents. And in fact, it cannot be entirely separated uh, from this whole philosophical spaghetti bowl that it is part of. It is literally intersected with other viewpoints at its inception. You might look at uh, this as a story from Marx to Lenin. Uh, yes, Vladimir Lenin, but it goes way beyond that into America into the 60s with that John Lenin. And think about the words of his song, Imagine. What a great gospel evangelistic presentation of a vision of utopia. Imagine social justice. Imagine racial justice as one subset of social justice. In the West, in Christianity in particular, we are under assault by what might be considered a foreign invader to ideological uh, viewpoints that have been long standing. Uh, things that have made the West great, as some would see it. You know, uh, capitalism that has brought half the world out of poverty free speech, academic freedom, uh, which has now moved into cancel culture, uh, democracy, uh, science, the universities, the hospitals, all of which have Christian denominational names on most of them. Christianity has long been considered a tour de force in impacting the world for good, or so we thought. But now we're saying, seeing it as being colonialist, imperialistic, evil in a sense for all of the world and it's not just us that's experiencing this this is getting exported from america from american universities into universities around the world as well in vishal magawadi's book the book that made your world we have one view of how the west won how the west developed in such a good way to um, make the world a better place and we argue that that's from a Christian perspective, that the foundational basis for that uh, was foundational Christian doctrines. That's been rewritten, you might say, by someone like Steven Pinker. Bill Gates considers this his uh, new favorite book of all time, Enlightenment Now, the case for or the apologetic for reason, science, humanism, and progress. But Steven Pinker, a neo-atheist, along with Richard Dawkins and the like, are all being dethroned now by, is everyone really equal? An introduction to key concepts in social justice education. Imagine social justice. Imagine a new world view that is upon us. So as we begin thinking, before getting to that, uh, you know, I could ask the question, since we're thinking about CRT, which is a subset of CT, critical race theory of critical theory, uh, we could ask the question, do you want to be racist 
or anti-racist? Let me ask that question. How many want to be racist? Raise your hand. Anybody? Somebody? Bueller? Bueller? <laughs> right? Would you admit it? How many want to be anti-racist? Raise your hand. Ah, oh, half the room. So I can get you to sign on that. Come on up here, sign on that. And then once you sign it, I'll tell you what's in it. <laughs> See, that's part of the deception here. This is why this is moving so quickly. Most people don't know what critical racism is, much less critical uh, theory, or what critical race theory is, much less critical theory. You hear sound bites from it. We all know that something is shaking in our society heavily right now. I think about this movement like um, Tom Cruise's The War of the Worlds, where these alien life forms were embedded in the Earth's surface maybe for thousands of years. And something happened at a point in time that triggered it, and it all just, all hell just broke loose, literally around the world. And that's what we're seeing. Where did this come from? What is going on here? Now you get sound bites all the way into the corporate world, like Coca Cola, be less white. What in the world does that mean? I mean, it seems sort of mean, doesn't it? Well, it's derived from Robin D'Angelo's writings, the author, best-selling author of White Fragility. She's made it into the corporate world. And those who do know the term critical race theory often misunderstand it. I had a debate with the president of an academic society, a Christian one, who was defending on social media tenets of critical race theory. And he then admitted that he didn't really even know what it was. A friend of mine who is a black pastor and runs in some circles that I run in was endorsing critical race theory books. And when I met with him to talk about this, he told me he had never heard of critical race theory or critical theory. We were recently canceled at one university by another campus ministry organization and when I and some of my national leadership met with theirs to discuss this, whether we want to be part of cancel culture or a solution to it, they admitted that they didn't even really know what critical theory or critical race theory was. How can we fight this thing if we don't know what it is? The Apostle Paul told us that we need to beware of false philosophy, which presupposes that we first need to be aware of what false philosophy is. And this is a subtle philosophical uh, entry, infiltration at every level, every strata in our uh, country and in civilization right now. What we're seeing is nothing short of a cultural revolution. And we need to listen. Epictetus, the Greek philosopher, said we have two ears and one mouth for a reason, so that we listen more. So we want to give kind of a history. You know, as George Santayana said, um, those who don't remember history are condemned to repeat it. What is Marxism and why does it matter? Well, it matters a lot. We experience its effects every day. We don't even realize it. We don't need to know who Marx was. We don't need to know um, what Marx's teachings were to be experiencing it. Ideas have consequences. And not only to be consuming it in our experience, but also turning out to be producing it without realizing what we're producing. Marxism is an ideology built upon the 19th century German philosopher Karl Marx. His philosophy had various versions to it. You had Mao, Chairman Mao Zedong in China. You had uh, Lenin. The Russian Revolution, I just got that flag from my wife's uh, play. She directed Anastasia or Anastasia at the local high school. And I said, I need that flag. I've got a presentation coming up. Uh, the Russian Revolution, Stalin, Mao, North Korea, Cuba, Venezuela, on and on and on. Under that regime, 100 million or more lost their lives, making Hitler turn over in his grave. The Germans lost. The German people apologized. They realized what they did was wrong. The Russians won. There was never an apology. And they've gotten away with murder. This ideology 
is deeper than you realize. Next to the Bible, the Communist Manifesto is the most sold book in human history. We would be incredibly naive to think that it died in 1989. Marx authored that and the Das Kapital. Uh, when I first read Das Kapital in a Marxist course in grad school at Purdue, I got it. I felt the bleeding heart that Marx felt, you know, going through the Industrial Revolution at the time and, and seeing some of the squalor and, and the system and, and the pain and the poverty. You could see it happening in Russia, the nobility, the feudal system, the serfs, the peasants, the French Revolution, which Marx looked at and just loved, and salivated, as did Lenin. You get why people want to revolt and they want change and they want hope in certain situations. Marx once said that philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways, but the point is to change it. Marx was an activist, not just a theorist. He was also another A word, which I won't use here. I'll just say he was a bum. <laughs> Marx couldn't take care of his own checkbook. He never really had a job much of his life. He lived off the charity of his own family. His dad was a Jew, converted to Protestantism to uh, continue his business. His mom was a Protestant, all nominal. Of course, Marx became an atheist early on. He lived off the charity of his parents. He lived off uh, the money of his co-author, Engels. Uh, his wife's mother provided him her with a maid and he slept with her, sired a child and occasionally allowed the child to visit his mother. It was terrible to his own family. Several of his own children committed suicide. Marx was not a good man. Then if Marxism is so bad, why do so many young people think it's so good? One reason is they don't remember their history. And we're living in times which is making it more and more attractive. You know, when people think of communism, they think way back when, or they think if you talk about communism, if you talk about Marxism, uh, they think you're talking conspiracy theory. Uh, communism is an economic theory anyway, and is there any perfect economic theory? Um, they contrast it with capitalism and sometimes the way they're, they're shown things in the media is that capitalism is evil. You have these greedy people. One person's greed is another person's envy, of course, right? But for Marx, he was never really about economics anyway. That was tertiary for Marx, economic criticism. Political criticism was secondary. Religious criticism was primary. Marx said that religious criticism is the criticism above all criticism. Notice the term criticism in critical race theory. Marxism holds that human societies developed through class struggle. It was built on conflict theory between the haves and the have-nots, the bourgeois and the proletariat. Those have-nots and the haves were in battle over the means of production and wealth accumulation. Utopian society, this imagine, this dream, requires not only abolishing all private property, it's essential, but also abolishing religion. Marx even talked about the guillotine for serious religion. Nominal religion we could put up with for a time. Serious religion, there is no tolerance for it. None. Marx inspires a religion of revolution. That's what it's about. It is a worldview, and when you think again about critical theory or critical race theory, think about the first four letters of theory. Theology. It is a view of the whole world. It has its own view of reality, its view of knowledge, and its view of ethics, and it has a methodology. See, the, the Marxists, even the neo-Marxists, unlike the neo-atheists, who really have no serious ground for ethics. You might think that the Marxists don't either, but they see there that they are on the right side of history, that there is a good and bad, even if that doesn't seem consistent with their viewpoint. Their view of reality and the way things ought to be is a view that some people, as a means to the end, 
just need to be eliminated, need to be canceled. Even some of the neo-atheists today in cancel culture are starting to find there's no grace here. Well, what, what, I, what about me? No, canceled. What's Marx's relationship to religion? Well, Christian religion teaches that God made man in his image. Marx turns around in his Thesis of Feuerbach, one of his influential philosophers, it is not religion which creates man, but man who creates religion. Marxism is a state-building worldview. It demands the whole of you. It is statist. At least that's the intermediate state maybe called the dictatorship of the proletariat or socialism that eventually will just wither away as Marx thought and Lenin taught and move into communism. In one sense, some of those defenders of it are right that it's never really been tried. It's never gotten past the success of even socialism in that sense. You get to the communist state of Russia, but it, it never withered away. Religion for Marx is, in, in a sense, real. Uh, it not only redistributes the good, but like religion, it tells us what is good, even without a foundation for good. Religion wasn't merely part of the oppressor class creating a sort of uh, Christian hegemony of oppression, but in fact it is the sigh of the oppressed creature. And so he sees himself, his viewpoint, as a liberator of these people who are giving into oppression and turning around and producing more oppression by religion. Religion is the sigh of the oppressed creature, the sentiment of a heartless world, and the soul of soulless conditions. It is the opium of the people, the opium of the masses. The rich people during difficult times can get the good drugs, the opium, the cocaine, and so forth. The poor people, poor in mind and poor in pocketbook, they just need Bible. They need religion. But you give them their basic needs, and religion will go away like that. Religion is only there because of socioeconomic oppression. But if you redistribute the wealth, religion is no longer needed. The paper that I, I published uh, near my end of grad school at Purdue um, on Marx's view of, of uh, knowledge, um, I discuss how Marx saw religion as illusory, as some sort of uh, knowledge or epistemic defect or cognitive dysfunction that religious people have. God is not real, so it's like shooting air balls when we pray, right? It's delusional, the God delusion, Richard Dawkins. Um, but if God does exist, maybe the uh, shoe fits on the other foot, right? Whereas Freud taught that religious belief was due to internal psychosis, crazy people, uh, you know, having some sort of wish fulfillment, Marx thought it to be um, and something that's brought on through external means, an internal delusion related to socioeconomic oppression. And according to Marx, if you liberate people from their oppression, again, man will simply throw off rather than continue using it as a crutch. He didn't concern himself, like many of his time, of the truth of religion. He was concerned only about its rationality. And since it's already uh, decided that it's false, you have to figure out why religious believers actually believe this delusion that they believe. Is it an internal problem or an external one? Is it Freud or is it Marx, right? Uh, but one cannot say that um, another viewpoint is irrational unless and until one first presupposes an answer to the ultimate question, that is God's existence. If God exists, then the person who is irrational, cognitively defective, not playing with a full deck, is the other person. But Marx already decided that, and by the end, the ethic was workers of the world unite, right? Marx wasn't about reformation, he was about revolution. He saw conflict and resolution going in one historic direction, and it was predictable from his vantage point. A lot of failed predictions. The neo-Marxists had to sit down, scratch their head, and figure out how are we gonna make this work now? But if the problem is social oppression, then the solution is liberation. Well, again, cultural Marxism, the new Marxism, neo-Marxism, critical theory didn't die in the Cold War in 1989. It was just beginning. In the last six months, I've been in a revolution study group, mostly with attorneys. 
And we've been reading through all the major writings from Lenin to Mao to Marx, the French Revolution, which was just absolutely horrific. Uh, you know, wanting to get rid of the nobility, get rid of the, uh, the, the priests, uh, get rid of all semblance of God and begin in, you know, uh, 1791 with a new calendar to get rid of B.C. and A.D., it was a bloody revolution. They were all very bloody. But there were two failed revolutions along the way, and they were the German and Italian revolutions. And they only failed because these globalist socialists, Marxists, were overcome by national socialists, Nazis, in Germany and Italy. But their leaders and their ideas continued on to what might be the greatest revolution ever the taking over of something like America and the West from the inside out. And so you can think about this term cultural Marxism as synonymous to neo-Marxism, to critical theory, to political correctness, identity politics, social justice. If those are like socks, throwing them on a wall, if one sticks for you, that's probably in the ballpark of what we're talking about. Oops, I'm gonna skip that. Uh, critical theory, is currently the reigning paradigm in academic disciplines, in what we might call grievance studies, gender studies, women's studies, peace studies, critical race theory studies, anthropology, queer theory, liberation theology, which started at the same time in the 60s as a hybrid of Marxism and Christianity, externally a Christian shell, internally Marxist, and forms the ideological foundation for large segments of the social justice movement. You can uh, characterize it, uh, that's helpful. Again, there's a view of reality, of human nature and relations, a view of knowledge, how we come to know, and then a view of the good life. What is real, how do I know what is real, and how should I then live based on what I know about reality? Individual identity, we don't think about individuals now, we think about the collective, group identity, right? It's all about power dynamics. Individual identity is inseparable from group identity as oppressed and oppressor. Oppressor groups subjugate oppressed groups through the exercise of hegemonic power, uh, a way of controlling the ideology through narratives, through language, discourse, uh, the, um, the normative values, the beliefs of a culture. And our fundamental moral duty is freeing oppressed groups from their oppressors. And how do we come to know these things? Not by science, not by data, not by evidence per se, but by lived experience, by stories, by anecdotal appeals to sympathy, appeals to pity. Lived experience is more important than objective evidence in understanding oppression. Oppression groups hide their oppression under the guise of objectivity. When I toured several universities uh, about a year ago with uh, atheist author who wrote the manual for creating atheists and we were allies together on this issue of viewpoint diversity and trying to cancel cancel culture we had one group that tried to cancel us and called us logical fascists the Marxists always hated the fascists Stalin didn't like Hitler anti-fascism anti fa now you get where it's coming from oppressor groups hide their oppression under the guise of objectivity Talking facts, that's just Western colonialization, imperialization, trying to keep your power. It's all about power dynamics. Individuals at the intersection of different oppressed groups experience oppression in a unique way. And this doctrine of intersectionality was developed 1989, 1991 at the foundation of critical race theory in part of critical race theory, and that's why it can't be completely separated. The Frankfurt School in Germany, that's where the neo-Marxists got together, scratched their head in the 20s, uh, saying, what are we gonna do here? Marxist predictions didn't come to pass, but we know that it was right, it was in the ballpark somewhere. They were called the Frankfurt School of Critical Theory. It's where it comes from. Most of the founders were both globalist socialists, Marxists, and also Jews. Bad place to be in 1933 at the rise of the National Socialist Party. They had to get out of there, went to Geneva, and then quickly went to America, ensconced in Columbia University and Brandeis University, and then onto the West Coast in the UC system. 
developing their books and tracks and became very, very influential right in time for the 1960s student protests across the world and in America and the sexual revolution. And Antonio Gramsci, um, the Italian Marxist leader, imprisoned in his prison notebooks is where we get the idea of cultural Marx Marxism, the infiltration of uh, institutions in the West rather than radical violent revolution, which cannot happen. You need to go after the non-coercive institutes of education and religion. Are we seeing that? Interestingly, Gramsci's most authoritative uh, translation in our time was translated by the president of the International Gramsci Society, Joseph Buttigieg, Mayor Pete Buttigieg's father, Notre Dame. He talks about this as a war of position, not a war of movement. A war of movement is radical revolution. It's a frontal attack. It can't really happen in the West because of the cultural issues, the moat around the castle, so to speak. But once you've ensconced in the uh, right areas and you've taken over enough in the war of position, in the trench warfare, then the war of attack, of movement, is decisive. How did it take root in America? Well, critical theory, you just criticize everything in Western culture, family, race, sex, marriage, religion, capitalism, all of it. In Eros and Civilization, Marcusa talked about polymorphous perversity. He wrote about this stuff. Um, his, he was looked at as the faculty advisor of the sexual revolution. And in 1968, when the global protests were happening, entire countries, universities were being shut down and carrying signs, Marx, Mao, and Marcusa. Marx, Mao, and Marcusa. Marcusa's doctoral student was Angela Davis, one of the early founders in critical race theory. She got the Lenin Award from Russia. She's a professor in one of the UC systems. All of these works were intended to split society and oppress and oppress groups and cause dissent, to cause unrest. In Robin D'Angelo's book, Is Everyone Really Equal? That's really the more influential book, not the white fragility. Um, I don't even know, you probably can't even see those, I'm sorry. Um, when you look at uh, you know, people of color, you've got the oppression, which is racism, and the dominant agent group is white. You've heard of white privilege. Privilege entails power. Right? It's always about power dynamics. Now there's a thing called brown privilege, the intermediate group between white and black. No, it's not gray. Um, brown privilege, uh, peoples of color who are non-black who have unearned societal benefits as well. There's this atomistic dividing amongst race in even spectra of color. Um, classism, the owning class, sexism, cis men, um, in the area of sex, heterosexual, heterosexism, heteronormativism, some things that the Black Lives Matter movement condemned, if you remember. Heterosexuals are the dominant uh, oppressor group. Religion, Christians, ableism, the able-bodied, nationalism, citizens. Huh. Colonialism, white settlers. Again, there's a metaphysics and epistemology and an ethics, a view of reality, knowledge, and the good. Critical theory or critical race theory, now as we're getting more into it, uh, has a method of um, subverting civilization through dividing groups. It's no longer about individuals, remember. The Marxists don't like the individuals. They don't like individual rights. They don't even like equality. They don't even like justice. Do not think that the rhetoric which says that it's a continuation of the 1960s civil rights movement is real. This is a repudiation of the 1960s of many of the good elements of the civil rights movement. A repudiation even of Martin Luther King's focus on the content of the character, not the color of the skin. Here we have privileged being able-bodied against the disabled, 
Cisgender against the transgender, heterosexual against gay lesbian, white against non-white, male against female, upper class against poor, fertile against infertile. And this list goes on and on and on, and it gets micro along the way. Again, Marx, Mao, and Marcuse. Yeah, this might have died over there in 1989. Marcuse came here, and by the 1960s, his views, I mean, he was condemned personally by the Pope at the time as the revolutionary thinker. His doctoral students, his writings, and, and many of their writings got out there, and those graduate students at the time then went into academia, ensconced in the humanities and the social sciences, and began to write their books to the point where in the 90s, beginning of the 90s, right when this got started, they were infiltrating in the university. And this is what Gramsci called the long march through the institutions, or one of his later German students called it. It's a very patient, methodical approach getting through the areas of influence. Now I understand that it's mandated here in Chicago schools at the elementary school level. It's in government agencies all the way down to our elementary schools. And I assure you, it's in our churches, in our seminaries, in campus ministries and Christian academic societies. This is not about liberal or conservative. It is not about Republican or Democrat. This is a foreign invader from outside that has infiltrated. John Lennon's gospel, um, you know, it prioritizes what I said earlier about economic criticism being tertiary to the secondary political criticism, to the religious criticism being primary, yeah. right? Imagine no religion, no heaven, no hell. Imagine no country, globalism, no borders. Imagine no possessions, sharing all in common, no property. Imagine this new view, this new gospel. We won't listen to a song even though you want to. I want to talk a little bit about liberation theology. Liberation theology I first studied about 25 years ago. Um, and it is more real today than you realize. In some books, when I looked back at them last week, and I went, wow, I remember studying that. And it said, it's hardly in America. It's Central, South America. The Pope's having a real problem with it. Uh, you know, in some of the impoverished areas in South America, some rogue priests, Jesuits would uh, rebel and start revolution. And, and the crux passage in, in the Old Testament or of liberation theology was really the exodus, getting the bourgeois pharaoh off the back of the neck of the proletariat Israelites. Liberation or salvation is about being liberated from socioeconomic oppression down here. It's not just the social gospel that we used to talk about, but it's social justice. It migrated up north. Critical race theory, finally a definition. Uh, one of many, but from one of the originators, one of the founding members, um, Richard Delgado and uh, John Stefanczyk. So Delgado was in the beginning. In his book, uh, their book, Critical Race Theory and Introduction, uh, pages two and three, the critical race movement. Now, stop right there. Remember, theory, theos, God. It's, it's an attempt to explain the phenomenon. Movement is not theory. But this is consistent with Marx, who didn't want to simply interpret the world, but to change the world. It was built on a theology of hope and change. The critical race movement is a collection of activists and scholars interested in studying and transforming relationships among race, racism, and power. The movement considers many of the same issues that conventional civil rights and ethnic studies discourses take up, but places them in a broader perspective. Unlike traditional civil rights, Martin Luther King and others, which embraces incrementalism, there was progress and step-by-step -step progress. Critical race theory questions the very foundations of the liberal order, including equality theory, legal reasoning, enlightenment rationalism, and neutral principles of constitutional law. It was started by Derrick Bell at Harvard, a black uh, scholar in critical legal studies. There's that word critical again. And his doctoral student, um, Kimberly Crenshaw, who coined the term intersectionality, who wrote the book or the article Mapping the Margins. 
that you intersect all these different classes now. It's not just about economic haves and have nots, but race, class, sex, gender, ethnicity, nationality, ability, religion, and so forth. Ibram Kendi, the high priest of uh, critical race theory, spoke at Purdue earlier this year. And I remember him saying, as I attended the lecture, there is a racial component in everything. Some white guy came up to the mic and said, I don't know what to do, help me, I feel so guilty. Exactly, as you should, right? There's white privilege, white supremacy, and white guilt now. He says, what do I do? How can I help? And he says, well, if you, if you have a passion about anything, there is a racial component in everything. He says, for example, if you're concerned about climate change, climate change predominantly impacts those of the third world, of the people of color. He said everything, and you're starting to see it. It's everywhere. And what I said to the president of Purdue is this was the first speaker in a year of speakers coming in, almost all neo-Marxist speakers. I sent him this quote because he was the former Republican governor of Indiana, and I said, are you really ready for the Cranach School of Business to become anti-capitalist? Here's what this is teaching. Again, you cannot divorce anti-racist ideas from all those other intersecting ideas. Anti-racist policies cannot eliminate class racism without anti-capitalism policies. To truly be anti-racist is to be feminist. Now, half the people in this room, when I said, do you want to be anti-racist, raised your hand. Why did you do that? Because I gave you the option. How many want to be a racist? It's worse than being called a rapist today. How many want to be called a racist? No one. How many want to be an anti-racist? Everyone. That's why it's in the Chicago elementary schools. But do you know what it means after you've signed on the document? Then we'll find out what's in the bill. Anti-racist policies cannot eliminate class racism without anti-capitalism policies. To truly be anti-capitalist is to be feminist. To truly be feminist is to be anti-racist. We cannot be anti-racist if we are homophobic or transphobic. To be queer anti-racist is to understand the privileges of my cisgender, of my masculinity, of my heterosexuality, of their intersections. Critical race theory cannot be divorced from all of those other radical viewpoints that have all taken the 1960s stuff and put it on steroids and divorced it from the liberal order. So even Richard Dawkins recently had his Medal of Honor taken away from the Humanist Society, right? And he wondered, how? I, I, I'm a neo-atheist. I tried to destroy this worldview. What's going on? I apologize. <laughs> no. There's no forgiveness here. There's no absolution of sin. Jonathan Haidt, an atheist, NYU professor of psychology and New York Times bestseller of Coddling the American Mind, started a foundation that I'm part of uh, called Heterodox Academy. It's made up now of about 5,000 professors um, across the range of viewpoints, but there are 5,000 universities, so that's nothing. He says that uh, universities must choose now to either be truth universities or social justice universities. They cannot be both. Berkeley just poured in $25 million for 400 staff positions, almost all tax paid, that are designed to be political police, thought police, political officers. We call them die officers. Diversity, inclusivity, equity. The holy trinity of death. Anytime you see it die in a university, you know that's the demise of that institute. I was canceled at a seminary to follow up on a critical race speaker in that seminary because the academic dean prayed and she said God told her only the critical race theorist was to come. And then much to the chagrin of the faculty who wanted me to come, she told them she was going to hire a die officer a biased personnel to come in after. Why do you need one of those in a seminary? What is diversity? Well, you identify the oppressed groups in terms of systemic power, systemic whatever class you're talking about. You identify the oppressed groups in terms of systemic power and privilege. And then inclusivity, you assess blame of the oppressor groups. And then equity, 
There's no equality here. You rectify the injustice by redistributing outcomes of power and privilege. By coercion if necessary, but with the carrot to begin. Equality may not be equal. Not everyone is created equal in every respect, and that's not what the founders thought either. But more along the lines of equality of opportunity than outcome. But equity is far different. This stuff is about payback. This stuff is about revenge. And it's impossible. Only an omniscient being could figure out how to bring forth the reparative uh, qualities uh, necessary for all injustices everywhere for every race, class, gender, etc., going back hundreds of years or thousands of years. I'm going to get rid of those. Uh, by the way, just, you can't see these. I quickly put those up there. These showed up for days on the Smithsonian Institute website uh, talking about white privilege. And it was, you know, a hard work ethic, uh, rationality, logic, <laughs> terribly racist. They took it down quickly after a couple of days, but Rob and Angelo had something to do with that. Uh, I picked this page out of Vody Bauckham's recent book. He's an African-American uh, scholar and pastor. Um, it's something that happened recently, George Floyd. This is what set the world on fire again, right? Uh, and it was terrible. You watched it. You saw it on the media. You saw this knee on the back, and you wondered how, how terrible is this? You know, um, in 2020, uh, police called in response to passing a counterfeit bill. He wasn't, you know, he wasn't an angel, didn't deserve death, but passing a counterfeit bill. He had a knee, knee on the neck for about eight minutes. Um, the officer's demeanor was calm and serious. Uh, you saw them there. Several of them were minorities, too. Um, the officers were arrested and charged. All lost jobs. Some face prison time. See what else. Multiple funerals, congressional recognition, police reforms, name on everyone's lips, say the name, nationwide protests, riots in Portland. It's still going on almost 10 months now. But did you ever hear of Tony Timpa in 2016? Timpa called the police and asked for help. He had the knee on the hands and the back of the neck, not for eight minutes, but for 14 minutes. He died. The cops were mocking and laughing. And they were saying, is he dead? Is he dead? Not quite certain. Officers neither arrested nor charged and footage withheld for three years. No one knew his name and few ever heard of his case. Why? It didn't fit the narrative. Racism only goes one direction in this new view. It's about changing the narrative through language. Knowledge is a social construction of reality. Knowledge about gender, knowledge about race, knowledge about everything. And racism can only be done by those who are in privilege and power. So even though there's a majority, for example, of women in America, they're still considered not a minority as opposed to majority, but minoritized. And it's the minoritized, the oppressed group, who has true access to knowledge. It's a Gnostic, secret knowledge. And if you have intersectional um, group identities, you have really good knowledge. What if you are black and woman compared to black men or black woman lesbian or black woman lesbian with one leg, right? I, so I'm serious about this. I was told by a department head of a university around here yesterday, I was at his home, a friend of mine, came across the email on race issues within the university and one white professor said in defense of this other white professor, said, well, maybe he doesn't, maybe he identifies as black. Maybe he's really black, how do we know? A black scholar responded back and said, this is BS, and this is divisive. And the response was, well, how do we know? Remember Rachel Dolezal a couple of years ago, white claimed to be black, simply self-identified. Knowledge is a social construction of reality. BLM got billions of dollars, and she recently bought several million dollar homes. 
Of course, Marxists never live down in the tents with everybody else when they revolt, right? On the website and in an interview, she said, we are trained Marxists. She was also a speaker at Purdue this past year, as was Robin DiAngelo. One of the first schools in the United States to sign the Chicago Statement of Academic Freedom. She said, we disrupt the Western prescribed nuclear family structure requirement by supporting each other as extended families and villages that collectively are for one another, especially our children, to the degree that mothers, parents, and children are comfortable. We foster a queer affirming network. When we gather, we do so with the intention of freeing ourselves from the tight grip of heteronormative, as opposed to homosexual, thinking, or rather the belief that all in the world are heterosexual unless she, he, or they, he, whatever, disclose otherwise. This is not just a Black Lives Matter website. It's a critical race theory or critical theory website. It's subversive. It's disruptive to Western culture. Picture of this student was a classmate of mine, a peer of mine, sat next to me when I published that paper on Marxism. He's an anarchist. He cleans up well. He used to wear makeup on the eyes and knuckled hands and everything. Recently got tenure at a university in Texas and was being investigated by the attorney general because he quoted something that was very similar to what Diderot, the French philosopher, quoted that inspired the French Revolution to go guillotine the nobility and the, the ecclesiological um, pastors. I want the entire world to burn until the last cop is strangled with the intestines of the last capitalist, Diderot said, until the last king is strangled with the entrails of the last priest. I want the entire world to burn until the last cop is strangled with the intestines of the last capitalist, who is strangled in turn with the intestines of the last politician. He carries an Antifa flag. Red for socialism, black for Antifa, anti-fascists. He cleaned up well. Many suit up well. Black liberation theology, this is from the founder in America as it came up through South America and Central America. James Cone recently died. He said, there can be no theology of the gospel which does not arise from an oppressed community. The God of the oppressed takes sides with the black community. God is not colorblind in the black-white struggle, but has made an unqualified identification with blacks. The revolutionary context requires only one principle which guides the thinking and action of black theology, an unqualified commitment to the black community. But can't racism go two ways? No. It's all about power and privilege. You can only be racist if you are in power. And racism has also become structuralized, systemic, depersonalized. Of course, under Marxism, we depersonalize, we dehumanize. Ah, another liberation theological thinker. My work with liberation theology, the Latin American theologians, with the Black Theology Project, and what the Cuban Council of Churches taught me 30 years ago was the importance of Marx and the Marxist analysis of the sociologies of the vulnerable and the oppressed. Reverend Jeremiah Wright, the pastor of the church where Obama attended for 20 years, baptized his children. He was a student of James Cone. Obama said in his own book, to avoid being mistaken for a sellout, I chose my friends carefully. The more politically active black students, the Marxist professors, the structural feminists. At night in the dorms, we discussed neocolonialism, Eurocentrism, and the patriarchy. The Reverend Dr. now Georgia Senator Raphael Warnock did James Cone's eulogy and was Cone's PhD student. He also sat in the pulpit until a few months ago of Martin Luther King. Warnock says the early church was a socialist church. Go back and read the Bible. We need to level the playing field. And to be concerned about the poor does not make you a socialist. It is what makes you a Christian. Well, I thought you were a Christian a different way. And that's just a fruit of being a Christian. And it means that you believe everybody is a child of God. Oh, I thought you had to receive Christ in order to become a child of God. He then said in a tweet quickly deleted recently over Easter, 
The meaning of Easter is more transcendent than the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Whether you're a Christian or not, through the commitment of helping others, we are able to save ourselves. Liberation theology is not Christian. Social justice, in most of the forms represented, is not Christian. And oftentimes, it's the height of injustice. Again, there's the definition. In the 60s, when some in Europe carried the, the banner, Marx, Mao, and Marcuse, some in the good 60s black revolution carried signs. I am a man. I am a man. What that meant was I should be treated like everybody else. Look, for whatever failures there were in the founding, the founding documents prescribed the, the demise of slavery and the rise of the civil rights that always should have been there and there are complications behind that we can get into at some other time. But Kimberly Crenshaw in 1989, when the wall fell, her together with Derek Bell wrote Mapping the Margins on Intersectionality, Identity Politics, and Violence Against Women of Color. She says, basically, no, you are a black man. And by the way, black men are also violent against black women. And I don't even like the term women because it contains men, right? Persons, contains son, it. They. Well, why the attraction? Because there's a moral cause. The old naturalism that we saw 20 years ago in neo-atheism, it was dry, it was science. There's no morality behind it. This gives you a sense of purpose, of justice. And because it started out in an atheistic uh, worldview in Marxism, it's no longer beholden to atheism. It has jumped tracks and this virus has morphed and found a more vi viable host in Christianity. We believe in original sin. We believe we're guilty. We believe that we've oppressed people and that God hates oppression and that he wants justice. And when the terminology of justice and oppression and what would Jesus do comes along, we sucker into insidious false philosophy, slavery and other narratives, all horrendous things. What a lot of people don't realize is slavery has been the majority report throughout the history of the world. And the only time it was racialized was in this context, right? The amazing thing was is that only in the West and only at this time was there a, an affront to end slavery, even by military force. And this idea of the 1619 Project America's original sin. Look, no one's saying everybody was perfect. But first of all, as black scholar Vanderbilt points out, political science professor, those slaves that came to Virginia were indentured servants, much like almost two-thirds of whites who came across Europe, indentured servants. The way you interpret a lot of the slavery in the Old Testament was similar to that. Things got bad over time with many of them, but this idea that this country was entirely built on the backs of sin is not the full picture. 300,000 people gave their lives. And talk about generational poverty. What about their children left without a breadwinner who live now in West Virginia in some of the poorest regions in the country? Who's going to pay them back? What about 350,000 current Nigerian immigrants to America who on average have more education and money than the average American exactly. and came from a place where 90% of the slaves were captured to give to the whites on the ships. Where did they get their wealth to come over to America? Would they pay back? Obama, 50-50. Does he count as white? How do we do this? It's not like we should be against retributive justice and, and reparation in, in principle for, for anything. If we do wrong, we ought to right the wrong we've done. But how do you go back hundreds of years, thousands of years? And how do you avoid allowing a Marxist philosophy from which there is no apology, there is no grace, there is no forgiveness, there is no absolution of sin, to exploit something like this 
to even ruin Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement. There was progress. The legacy of slavery, Thomas Sowell, one of the best economists of this country, up at his peak right now, Stanford, 90 years old. He talks about how the legacy of slavery, if you want to compare apples to apples, the legacy of slavery in the black family right now, where poverty, the, the ultimate predictor of poverty is fatherlessness, the black family was not ruined by the legacy of slavery as much as it was by the 1960s welfare policies. The poverty rate was not as great 100 years after the end of slavery as it was just a generation after the 60s. The black family was largely intact before that time. Now they're 75% without fathers. The explanation of that is in our time. Redefining of racism as unilateral and structural. Systemic racism. America is systemically evil from its origin. Well, what do we mean by systemic racism anyway? That, that's, that's a load of questions, a definition. Here's a common definition. Any practice or policy that creates or perpetuates racial disparity or inequality. Remember, this movement believes that inequality entails injustice. If you find inequality anywhere, race, class, sex, gender, at all, there is injustice lurking there. Inequality used to be a mathematical notion, injustice a moral one. Now they're combined. Any practice or policy, well, guess what does that? Marriage does that. If you're married, there will be inequalities financially. Then if you are single in non-married home, raising children. So what, we get rid of marriage? We do what Marxism or socialism does across the board and makes everyone poorer? About basketball, 75% of the athletes are black. Inequality entails injustice? Or do we want to say there's some merit there? They're good. Well, what about the policies? It's discriminatory against someone. Who? Well, the hoop has to be 10 feet tall. Who's it discriminated against? Where is the privilege of power to come in? The tall people, not the short people. That's a policy and practice that creates or perpetuates disparity or inequality. Maybe not racially, but someone. I mean, people are paying millions of dollars who are taller. Remember that early illustration, equality versus equity, standing on the thing? How are you going to make up for those people? That is a systemic problem. Incarceration rates. And I'm not saying there aren't injustices or problems. But you don't wreck an entire system over some problems. You fix the problems. Oh, incarceration rates have 93% male. Ah! Inequality entails injustice, sexism. No one's claiming sexism here. The black scholar's denial from atheist to theist or some that we need to read that the media doesn't present to us. From Stanford's Thomas Sowell and uh, the final speaker at Purdue, finally, uh, Shelby Steele, who wrote the book White Guilt, How Blacks and Whites Together Have Ruined the Promises of the Civil Rights Era. He denied last month there is no systemic racism. Let's at least have a debate. But now today, debate is hate. Right? Or let's hear from atheist scholars like John McWhorter at Columbia University, African American, who also denies it and sees the Marxism in this stuff. Or like um, Glenn Lowry, Harvard's first, Harvard's first um, African American tenured professor, now at Brown University. Or Carol Swain, African American scholar with the equivalent of a Nobel in her field of political science and law. Look, let me just come to an end here. Should Christians support the social justice movement? The Bible is filled with commands to care for the poor, to defend the powerless, to seek justice for the widow, the orphan, free the oppressed. Christians should use care to adopt rhetoric that subverts Christianity. Stick with biblical terms like justice, like compassion. Don't allow Trojan horses to get smuggled in. Social justice is not necessarily just. Economic justice, socialism, racial justice, the gospel of anti-racism. 
reproductive justice, abortion, gender LGBTQ justice, which is polyamory or multi-identity, research justice, only use minoritized texts, climate justice, climate change laws, human trafficking. Okay, finally, we get a real one. Um, it's often driven through the lens of sociology and culture, not through the lens of theology and scripture. We need to think about old Abe, Abraham Lincoln, who said that in this age, in this country, public sentiment is everything with it. Nothing can fail against it. Nothing can succeed. These arguments are being based on the appeal to pity. And people's hearts sink, and they don't map their minds and their hearts together to come to solutions. Critical theory has emerged from its Marxist origins, but it has gone beyond that. Um, I, need to, I need to come to an end here. Look, we need to see people as created in God's image. That is the ground for uh, all lives being sacred and for us bending over backwards to uh, help people. That's the ground for the golden rule. Uh, we have knowledge. Knowledge is objective. Yes, our perspective can shape things, but we do have knowledge. Knowledge is central to the gospel according to Jesus, the knowledge of God. And God's word is truth. The basic biblical knowledge. Basic knowledge is available to all. And God so loved the world that he gave his son for anyone who believes. Not just those who do the work of anti-racism or do the work of anti-sexism or whatever. We need to clarify the differences between justice and charity and not collapse the two and make it a statist issue. For further investigation, and I'll come to an end, uh, go to our website, pick up a 30-page booklet. You can get the hard copy out there. It's orange or go for free on our website. Uh, check out Chantel Monique Dusson's uh, website, Center for Biblical Unity. Look at uh, Neil Shinvi, apologetics.com. Bodhi Bauckham, the African-American scholar, just came out with the book last week, Fault Lines. Carol Swain, Vanderbilt. She's opposing the 1619 Project. Thomas Sowell, one of the best economists of our time. Shelby Still, another African-American out of Stanford. Glenn Lowry, of Harvard's first uh, you can listen to his podcast along with atheist John McWhorter from Columbia. These are bright, academically rigorous people, African Americans, who are not going with the narrative. Of course, they're going to be called people who are lacking liberational consciousness or have uh, some kind of internalized oppression. So they're going to be written off as well because there is a narrative and we don't want logic to, to come into this. We need to buy the narrative. We don't need to buy the narrative. The narrative subverts the Bible, it subverts Western civilization. Thank you.